chocolate. The Chocolate Touch by Patrick Skeen Catling, illustrated by Margot Apple. Chapter Eight. English class passed without incident. Miss Plimsoll distributed word lists for her pupils to take home. The more words you know, she explained as always, the more exactly you can think. There were some difficult new words. John noticed, avarice, indigestion, acidity, unhealthiness, moderation, digestibility. As Miss Plimsoll explained the meaning of each one. It seemed to John as though they all had a special bearing on his present uncomfortable condition. At last, the bell rang. Very well, class, Miss Plimsoll said. Time for outside activities. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Miss Plimsoll. Miss Plimsoll gave the signal for dismissal, and the pupils in the front row filed out, followed by those in the second row, including John and Susan. Susan played a violin in the school orchestra, and usually she and John went to the rehearsals in the auditorium together. This time, Susan hurried on ahead of him. John followed very slowly. The members of the orchestra were sitting at their music stands on the auditorium stage when John, carrying his dark blue trumpet case, got to his chair in the brass section. Mrs. Quaver had already begun to explain a difficult passage to the girl who played the flute. Just after Jay sings, nestlings chirp and flee. She was saying, "You come in with your trill, doodle loodle 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 loo." Do you see the place on your score? Good. Ah, John! Mrs. Quaver exclaimed, seeing him in his place. I'm glad you're not absent, as I have just told the others. This afternoon we're having the first joint rehearsal of my arrangement of a boy song by James Hogg. We've been all over the individual parts and all the sections you will recall. Now it's time to fit the pieces together. John nervously opened his trumpet case and took his shiny golden trumpet from its bed of scarlet velvet. The beautiful new instrument gave him confidence. He worked the valves nimbly with his fingers, and looked up at Mrs. Quaver again. Now, John, she said, tell me when your little solo begins. Right after the end of the second verse, John promptly replied. He had practiced his part every evening in the basement at home for the last two weeks. He knew every note perfectly. After the line. That's the way for Billy and me. Good, Mrs. Quaver said, and don't forget what I told you, John. This is a happy song. I want you to play, ta ta, ta ta, ta ta ta, ta. Simply repeating the rhythm of the voice, and I want you to be light and lively. This is supposed to be the song of a boy who loves romping in the country. Ta ta, ta ta, ta ta ta, ta. John thought that shouldn't be too difficult, even with the whole orchestra listening to him. He had played it over and over again at home, but he would have to try extra hard here. This was to be his first solo. Everyone else was depending on him to play it properly. Right," said Mrs. Quaver brightly, with her baton. She rapped twice sharply on the music stand before her. All the musicians brought their instruments into playing position. Susan poised her bow over the strings of her violin. John held his trumpet close to his mouth and wiggled his fingers on the valves. Mrs. Quaver's baton moved from side to side, up and then down. The cymbals clashed and the drums thumped. The pianist brought his fingers down on the ivory keys of the piano. The violinist and cellist made their wheen and whomping sounds. All were in perfect unison. The rehearsal had begun. After the introduction, one of the older boys began to sing, "Where the pools are bright and deep, where the gray trout lies asleep, up the river and over the lea, that's the way for Billy and me." After the last line of the first verse, 
John's fellow trumpeteer echoed the rhythm of the singer's voice. Ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta-ta, ta Mrs. Quaver smiled approvingly at the successful performance, and, with her baton, gave the singer the signal to begin the second verse. Where the blackbird sings the latest. An oboe went beep. Where the hawthorns bloom the sweetest. Where the nestlings chirp and flee. The flute warbled according to plan. That's the way for Billy and me. John swallowed with an effort and put the mouthpiece of his trumpet to his lips for his solo. The mouthpiece instantly changed to chocolate. Then almost as fast, the chocolate spread along the instrument, changing all the flashing gold into dull brown. The first note came out fairly true. Ta! But chocolate trumpets cannot withstand much pressure. The hole in the mouthpiece softened and clogged up, and the valve stuck as John desperately tried to finish his part. Mrs. Quaver's eyes almost popped out of her head as she listened to him play. It sounded as though John were trying to play a soap-filled bubble pipe. Terribly flustered, he put down his trumpet. Mrs. Quaver was speechless. The orchestra was rocked by uproarious laughter. The other trumpeter leaned over toward John's chair and picked up the trumpet. It's a chocolate trumpet, he shouted derisively. No wonder it sounded like that. John Midas was trying to play a chocolate. John didn't wait to hear any more. He fled from the stage and out to the playground. Without stopping even to look around, he ran through the stone gateway and homeward. I like chocolate everywhere, but I do not like it in my 